the question always comes to what is data and there's so many definitions right and so and of course it is always layered like data then it sort of starts to organize itself and become information and then it starts connecting it becomes knowledge and then if you start reaching certain important in points of insights and it becomes insight and then when you start connecting insights it becomes wisdom and the question is at scale for a very large population india is a country of 1.3 billion people if we were to look at this continuum across a society at large, what does it mean is a question that we have been grappling with. And, and very shortly, we'll talk about why have we been grappling with this question? Because the data is fertile and creative medium, but for whom? Well, of course, data for better control for monopolies, it has worked, we have seen that happening. Data to improve profits for capitalists, it has worked, we have seen that working. Data to govern better for governments, we have seen that working. Data for good for civil society organizations, we have seen that happen. The question that we are trying to wrap our heads around it, but where are the communities? Where are the individuals? Where are people? And what does it mean to any individual? And how do we look at that people-centric view of data? Communities, of course, have always played a very strong role as producers of data, because in the end, the data is produced by the interaction of humans um, and uh, in their different contexts. And that data is now available for all these different actors in the ecosystem to actually make difference and, and do what they, what they want to do. The question that we are also trying to understand is that many of these constructs, whether it is monopolies, capitalists, governments, or civil society organizations, do believe that this data is to be used for beneficiaries, but the question that we are trying to understand is, can we, can we invert this question to saying, can we look at data from the eyes of the people rather than from the eyes of the actors in the system or, or the systems? So let me go ahead and elaborate a bit on that. So this is a, it's a very favorite picture of mine. I was in this village in the Raigada district in Eastern part of India, and we are all sitting together on the ground. And this is a camera shot that I took from my phone. And we were talking about nutrition. We were talking about financial inclusion. And, and these are the women of a hamlet uh, and some of their, uh, the men, men of the community. And I asked them saying, do you all um, have some access to digital device? And they were all said, yes, of course. And interestingly, all of them had some or the other form of digital device. And I said, what do you do with it? And they said that, yeah, we use it to watch movies. We, I said, how do you watch movies? You don't have necessarily have data connections. I said, no, no, we don't need a data connection because a gentleman comes on a bicycle with a rope around his neck and he's got small, small SD cards there. And so he comes and he puts the card and he loads the movie in my phone and I can sit and watch the movie after my day's chores are done. I said, wow, that's so interesting. Don't you use it to manage your bank account? He said, no. I said, don't you use it to manage uh, uh, different kinds of uh, potentially understanding what is the price of things that you're producing or what's happening? He said, no, news, no. And I said, why? And they all had a blank look because I think a lot of industries are figuring it out as to how to get things across to people, but nobody's figuring out what does the world look like from their eyes? What does it look like? What does it mean for the people of the community to understand that they are, can be active users of data? Uh, not that they're only providers of data that somebody else can consolidate and create analysis and figure out what to be done, but they themselves can be actually active users of data. So that's the question that we have been trying, grappling with saying, how do we ensure that every citizen of the country is an active user of data rather than only provider of data so that somebody can synthesize and use the data to make sense? So we continued this thinking. Uh, an interesting progression that has been happening in India is called the construct of data empowerment. Uh, so there's a data empowerment and protection architecture. Today, our intent is not to go into it. It's a very, very important national scale uh, discussion that is progressing on saying, what do we mean by ownership of data? Who owns, who has the data, who benefits the data? How do we manage data for purpose, protection and privacy? And as a part of this body of knowledge, there has been a lot of interesting discussion on what are the fundamental principles of how one should look at data. For example, what is the meaning of restoring agency of people when you look at data? Or what is the meaning of informed consent? What is institutional accountability? 
accessibility and affordability, shared open infrastructure, incentives, reciprocity, interoperability of data, or data minimalism, how do you ensure you collect the least amount of data required for a certain purpose, enabling data rights, evolvability. And this has been a very important and a very, very in a central movement around saying, how do you use data in a democratic construct right, vis-a-vis -vis using data in some of the other countries, which could be for different purposes, the whole movement around this has been. So we said, this is one side, which is architecture as to how does a national infrastructure look at data because it has implications for how the government looks at data, how different sectors look at data. And, and I have pasted the link here, which I'll share with you. You can go and look at this body of work. You'll find it extremely interesting on, on how do you look at, at data democracy from the eyes of institutional construct, but still look at how does, what does data mean for the first mile, the people on the ground. But I think that set us off thinking into saying that can we take a, a, an individual view of data empowerment? And so if you look at this simple two by two matrix, let us try to understand uh, this as you meaning institution, I meaning I'm a, I'm a, this is a lady uh, who is a real character in one of our real person in one of our microfinance institution programs. And she is saying, I can see vis-a-vis -vis institution, you can see. So who has the ability to see uh, the data, the insights, the analytics? And on the other axis, you would see, I can solve my problem myself, or you can solve my problems. So you'll find interesting four conversations here. One is the institution sees because they collect all the data, they run all the analytics, they create all the reports, slicing, dicing, all sorts of things. And then they say, oh, now that we know what needs to be done, they prepare a solution. And then they say, now I have a solution that everybody should implement, right? And it has its own limitations because it, it, is, it, is, it is not very diverse necessarily because the moment you do something like this, you land up with a very standardized way of looking at a problem rather than embracing the diversity and complexity of the large scale ecosystem that we're dealing with. Sometimes it could be that the institution sees, but it tells the people saying, you solve this, you do this, right? So I, the institution sees and the individual solves, which we call as directed solving. So it's directing the institution, it's directing the individual saying, I have seen the data, I think you should do this in agriculture, or you should do that in farming, or you should do this in health. So there's a directive coming top down from the institution because they have the data and they have seen what needs to be done. Sometimes it so happens that the individual sees, if you look at the bottom right, and they request the institution saying, I can see this problem. You know, I have a water problem here. When we are working in water security uh, in some of the states, we realize that individual is saying, I have a water problem here. I think there's a contamination issue. I think the water table is falling. I'm having irrigation and farming problems and requesting the institution saying, please come and do something, please solve. So we call the requested mode. The quest that we are on is what does it take for individuals for this lady on the slide to say, I can see and I can solve. And if we can get to that understanding at scale that people can see and people can solve because of the infrastructure that we provide before, because of the way we create data designs, because of the way we use technology, as well as because of the way we build capacity of the system, then probably there could be a different paradigm of how large, complex, and difficult problems could be solved. You have experienced it in your lives. Remember, there was a time when you used to navigate the world with the AAA maps, right? You would be sitting in this car with this massive sheet of paper uh, on the side of your driving seat and you would be looking at this massive and you would say, where am I, right? You would look at A7 and I need to go to C4. Uh, and that was the world, right? And somebody had the data and they would produce this map and they give it this map to you. And now you have to figure your way out. And then today you have this blue dot moment in your life. You open your... Google map and says, this is where you are and everything is with respect to you. And we are saying, why can't that be for every farmer, every healthcare worker, every teacher saying, this is where you are with respect to you, here is the rest of the world. Vis-a-vis -vis saying, here is the rest of the world, go find your way, right? And so I think it is time that we really think about how do we move from the AAA world to the blue dot moment in every sector of development. And that's the question that we're obsessing with saying, why is it not that a, um, a midwife in a village 
can say, this is where I am. This is the village around me. This is the situation. This is the infrastructure. This is available. This is not available. This is what I can do. This is what I can't do. Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, sort of finding your way out and asking everybody in the institution, what can I do and what I can't do. So that is the quest. And we said, if you have to make this quest, there are four important capabilities, uh, which we call sense, make sense, solve, and aspire as a simple framework, right? So can I sense, have you built infrastructure so that I can sense, I can see when I want to, I meaning I the farmer, I the teacher, I the healthcare worker, I can see when I want to. Vis-a-vis -vis today where someone sees my data when they want to, right? So they see the data and they tell me what to do. Is that, can I see? Make sense. Can I make sense with the data that I see? Solve. Can I seek solutions or solve my own problems? And can I aspire for more data and new ways to solve? So can we make this inversion that somebody will figure this out and somebody will look at the data and do the analytics and find the answers vis-a-vis -vis I can see, I can sense, I can solve and I can aspire. What does it look like? So let's look at a few examples to bring this to real life. We have learned a lot from Foundation for Ecological Security. They work towards observation of nature and natural resources through collective action of local communities. It's a fascinating uh, program running in India. And they have this blue dot moment. Any villager can see the condition of water resources around her, understand how much water is available for her to use, discover a variety of ways to solve the water problem, build ways to maintain and increase water supply, demand budget or infrastructure for better access to water, leveraging the rich data to improve water security for the village. Saying it is in her hand, saying I can, I know what's going on here. And, and, and the effort is to give her the ability to sense, make sense, solve. I just want to tee off that, but I actually want to go into a very detailed example rather than give you just a high level example. And to do that detailed example, I'm going to bring in my colleague shortly. In summary, what we are trying to get to is that data classically has been used as a mechanism for measurement and evaluation. Right, saying improve your own ability to see and solve. I want to measure, I want to evaluate if my program is running well. Vis a vis data being used for agency empowerment, where we improve the person's ability to see and solve. This is the transition. To give you a deep dive into an example, I'm going to invite uh, my colleague to talk through a case on empowering education leaders. So we will take the example of education. And I'm going to introduce Kushbu, uh, who is here on the call. Kushbu uh, is an amazing leader. She's the chief operating officer of a program called Siksha Lokam, run by the Advaita Foundation. She's also the winner of Women Transforming India 2021, which makes me extremely proud to know her and to work with her. She's also co-founder and director of a, of a civil society organization called Mantra for Change. She has passed in the corporate life, working for Honeywell, Practo, Health, et cetera. In the field, she is actually delivering social impact at scale. She is an alumnus of Tata Institute of Social Science. And she has lots of gold medals behind her, including the ones for running marathons, which she's fond of doing. So, so here we are uh, with Kushbu. I'm going to hand over to Kushbu. Kushbu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Um, and hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be part of this discussion. And all the description and introduction that uh, uh, Sanjay sir gave, I think none of them, or many of them could not have been possible if Sanjay sir was not available as a mentor in our journey, as an organization and as an individual for me. So um, it's, it's really a great place to just come and talk about our experience of working with education leaders in India and what we have been doing and what we have been experiencing. Um, to give a quick context, my organization, Siksha Lokam, is an education leadership mission. As many of you on this call would already know that India has one of the world's largest education system. We have over 1.5 million schools in the country uh, that are catering to or on the mission of providing quality education to over 250 million children that are there in the India today. So um, our fundamental belief is, as an organization, is that like any organization, any of the organizations that we are part of, schools also need excellent leadership so that they can achieve their goal, their point of the game, which is to provide quality education. And hence our mission is to enable the learning opportunities for these 4.5 million leaders across our education system in the, in the country. 
Now, obviously, when I say leadership, there are so many definitions of leadership and what does an excellent leadership look like? All of you would have a different imagination. In our context, we define it as the ability to, uh, so if you could come to the next slide, please. Yeah, it's the ability to continuously sense what's happening around me, to make sense of what needs to change, to learn how to make that change happen, and finally apply that learning to actually improve things in my context. And you would notice how it, there's a slight variation from the earlier four words that uh, Sanjay sir was talking about in this call, about sense makes sense, solve, and aspire. And we had a similar definition. And we realized that to actually make these four verbs happen, to restore agency and to establish the belief that I can lead change, that I can drive these continuous improvements in my context, data plays a very, very important role, right? Over the last, over the next six, uh, five to six minutes, allow me to share two stories with you. And uh, we'll start with Mrs. Divya Lokesh. Yes, uh, she's a school principal in the suburbs of Bangalore, uh, the city where I'm currently uh, taking this call from. I met her almost five years back, and uh, it was in her school. It's, it's an affordable private school where, which caters to children from underserved communities. And when I met her, she shared how she has many dream projects, and as she called it, dream projects around how to make her school, school better. But she wasn't sure where to start. So when we started our engagement with her, our team showed her a simple school improvement framework. And there are so many out there because there are so many educationists and academicians who are working on school improvement as a subject. We showed her a simple school improvement framework that was available on our platform. It was a simple reflection and self-assessment form where she filled the responses. If you, so if you could come to the next slide. Yes. And when she filled this form, uh, she started uh, seeing the ratings on various parameters. The, sc the screenshot that you show uh, that you see on the screen right now, this was something that was available to her to say that on various parameters on the school, uh, school is an organization. How was her school performing? What was the areas where she was doing extremely well? Which were the areas where she 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 wanted to she needed to improve? So, I mean, once she and not. I mean, once she had access to this, and once she prioritized and decided to improve on a particular parameter, next slide, if we come to it, I'll show you how she had access to a whole repository of micro improvement projects that she could take up. And there was this whole guided journey that was made available to her at the tip of her fingertips to say, once you have prioritized, you have, you have filled your responses, you have sensed what is going great what is not going great now here are the, here are the ways in which you can improve so this is if you see next slide sir if you see because the relevant tools and the right data was made available to her she could freely engage in this whole cycle that we spoke about earlier of sense make sense learn and improve without any fear and this is very important and i and sanjasa did touch upon this where there's no fear that there's some big authority figure who is watching over me, who is uh, mandating things, what needs to be done, what I should be doing or not doing. So the fact that she could choose what to improve upon and how this feeling itself was very liberating, uh, built her confidence. And as of today, as a mission, as our organization, we are our team is working with different states to catalyze similar programs for school leaders like Mrs. Divya. I'll quickly talk about another story. And for this, I'll uh, take you to one of the northeast, northwestern state of uh, Punjab in India. Punjab has 19,000 schools as a state. And there are teacher mentors who are responsible to guide and support teachers who are working in these public uh, schools. Now, one of the constant thankless jobs that these uh, teacher mentors are engaged in is observing classrooms and giving feedback to teachers. So, Till the time, uh, once once we reached there, we, find, we found out that they were using these pen and paper forms to record their observations. Many of them were using, using uh, their own diaries to make notes about the classrooms. But there was never enough time to look back into those diaries and to, to make sense of what support these actually those teachers need. So at the end of it, what they were doing is visiting classrooms every week, every month. But there was nothing that the teacher was getting out of their visits or very little that they would get. So 
we started working in Punjab in 2019, just six to seven months um, before the pandemic hit us in India. We worked with the Department of School Education to create a simple observation form that these teacher mentors could access on their phone. If you come to the next slide, sir. Yeah. So you see, the form was available in their own native language, the language that they were comfortable with. So similar to Divya, ma'am, these teacher mentors started filling in the responses. And what surprised them, what took them by surprise was that the data was almost in real time made available to them in these very simple to understand graphs. Right? So these teacher mentors started filling the form and uh, you know they started making sense of this data on the go. Now, next time when they visited the same school, they could actually access the reports and say, oh, I know that this cohort of teacher actually needs support in this particular area. And teachers started appreciating their visits and looking forward to their visits. So at this point, no matter which uh, you know which words I use or how many sentences I speak, I'm sure that I'll never be able to express what this simple access to data in real time could enable for our teacher mentors. So what I'll do is I have a short video, a two minute video for you to listen to. Yeah, so if you could just play the video. And we can't hear not anything at all. on the video. Did you say that you can't hear? Yeah, it's not. Yes, audible. we can't hear. Oops, uh, that is not good news. Uh, Zoom always does that. Yes. All right. Now we should be all right. Hopefully. Hello everyone, my name is Dipali. I'm working as a block mentor science in East Pan block of Jalanda district of Punjab. Now I simply record my school visits on my mobile phone as there is a clarity in terms of what is to be observed. Now I'm able to understand the needs and challenges of my teachers in classrooms. Earlier I used pen and a paper to keep a record of my visits. But now, Darpan app helps me in maintaining the records of my multiple visits in a single school. Now, in fractions of a minute, I can retrieve the details of my visits to a particular school. The data in Darpan app helps me in understanding the challenges and the needs of a school. It also helps me to plan my schedule for the next visit. I can plan my meetings easily with schools and teachers as data from visits is very handy and easy to read. It also helped me to plan my conversations and support for teachers. For example, if I notice that a group of teachers is struggling with a key concept, I can plan a demo or an activity regarding that topic in blog meetings. Our meetings and discussions are now more data driven and focused on improvement. All right, so um, what I will do um, uh, that I want to pass the baton to you guys, which is whether um, we want to make sure that it's contextual to you. You heard our hypothesis that empowering communities with data can help them see and solve better. You heard two examples of how that can be done. So now we want your help to see if this hypothesis works for other problems, other communities, other geographies. And so to give it some structure, we want you to think of these three questions. In your community, who benefits the most with an ability to sense and make sense? Who's the first mile? And in certain cases, who's also who's the second mile? Who's the one helping the first mile? The second question I want you to think of is what data is valuable to this individual in the context of the problem you're working on? And the third one is how can you create this blue dot moment for them by integrating the data in their everyday lives? And you saw examples of um, in both the cases, how did they integrate it in everyday lives? 